All right. Welcome, everybody. We are excited to have you here. And uh, we are going to be talking about wearable technology as it relates to farm labor and health, wellness, and safety in um in the in in and on and around farms. So this is an ongoing uh, project that Aaron and Beth and I and several other members of our team have been working on now for several years. And uh, we are delighted to have Aaron Yoder with us today uh, because the the we have moved uh, from just managing labor into sort of the realm of now thinking about you know, where's technology going to take us? Where's mechanization going to take us? Um, what What is out there that science and technology is going to be able to offer us to help crack some of these real, very real um, um, uh, problems that we're seeing in farm labor? And so we're excited to have you all here today. We are recording this. The recording will be available after. And um, I will, without further ado, just say that I'm Mary Peabody with the University of Vermont Extension, and with me is Beth Holzman. Um, and Aaron Yoder is presenting today, so I'm just going to turn it over to Aaron. Thanks, Mary. And you'll have to let me know if I start cutting up. I just got the message that my internet connection is unstable, so I do have a backup if I get disconnected, but just let me know. Uh, <laughs> wave me down, ask questions, whatever. Uh, will do. So thanks so much, Mary. Uh, I'm excited to talk about this. This is a, a subject that I'm very passionate about. I really like uh, both the intersection of ag safety and health and technology. And uh, we'll make sure all you guys mute your microphones uh, while the presentation's going on, just to give you that reminder too, um, in case we have any background noises. So thanks for that. Uh, but at, with that being said, feel free to ask questions as we go along, either type in the chat. I know Mary will be looking at that. And uh, when we get to the right point, we can answer the questions as we go through this. Um, so uh, a little bit of the logistics out of the way. So again, I'm Aaron Yoder. I'm from the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Um, I'm in from a college of public health. Um, and one of my major um, projects and all, most of my projects go through the Central State Center for Ag Safety and Health, which is a NIOSH or National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health uh, funded Ag Safety Center. And there's, uh, I believe, 11 of those around the country. So there's probably one that covers your region or close to your region. Um, so you can always take a look at those as well um, when you're looking for resources like this. Um, and feel free to reach out to me at any time if you have questions uh, about different topics that I might be able to cover. So we're going to start um, by looking at what we're going to try to cover today. So again, taking a look at um, health and safety hazards, being able to identify those, and especially the ones that we think we can make an impact on or reduce with wearable technology. And we'll get a little bit into what that is and what wearable technology is. So I'm using the broadest definition possible, everything from the cell phones or other technology that we carry with us uh, to specific devices that we add um, to our stuff. And then um, discover what data we can collect with this wearable technology and how we can use that. And then how to select different technology apps um, and so forth as we go through that. And then hopefully we'll have some time at the end to talk a little bit and give you guys a chance to share what's been working for you or have you been using anything or any other questions that we may have. Um, so before I dive too deeply into my stuff, I wanted to know a little bit about your experience with wearable technology. So Mary's gonna put up a few polls for us here quickly um, and a few questions to answer. So feel free to, to answer those and come, uh, hit your submit buttons and we'll roll through those. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any surprises on this one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Next up. Uh, let's see if we can. Oh, whoops, it came up the same one again. Oh. And All right. Next question. Have you ever used wearable technology? 
in the broadest sense of the term. Okay, looks like we've got quite a few. All right, good to know. Uh -huh. And let's see. And next one is how confident are you in your ability to operate wearable technology? Okay. Oops. I need to get to know you extremely confident people. <laughs> Even the very confident. Well, I just learned something brand new today that my Fitbit does that I never knew. So I'm not sure I how to even answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just a few more. I think there's two. just two more, right? Yeah. So if someone were to monitor your health while you're wearing it, who would you want to be? Just yourself, your supervisor, both or nobody? Okay. Not surprising. Interesting. And one more similar question, but it's about monitoring your work environment. So the environment, the previous question was health and how it's looking at the environment around you while you're working. Okay. A few more people willing to share their information with their supervisor when it's just about their environment. And that's pretty typical to what we see. Mm -hmm. And last right. one. Oops, Clips. nope. I think we already did that one. Yep. I think that might be all of them we have in this. That system. was it. Yep. Thank you, Mary. So that gives us a little bit of insight about who we're working with and who, uh, who else that we're going to talk about or who else. Uh, how we're going to talk about some of this stuff and how it comes into play and similar to what we found in other arenas. Um, so what I was going to do is start off with some of these different, as you can see on the first goal there, some of these hazards and then how we can apply wearable technology to that. So the first one looking at is noise injury or noise induced hearing loss, if you want to call it that. We know about two thirds of the farming community have some sort of limitations to their hearing based on exposures that they've already had. And this is pretty typical even in the general population uh, from lots of different exposures that we have out there. Um, we know that with that there's damage done to the inside of our ears and the cochlea and that this damage is not repairable. Uh, once we destroy those, they don't grow back. They don't fix themselves. A lot of our bodily functions fix themselves if we hurt, injure them. Our hearing's not one that it does. Um, Typically, it's a painless process. You know, we might have really loud noises that hurt our ears, but the damage that occurs to our hearing occurs over time. And also, we know it's preventable by not being exposed to those larger sound or those louder sounds and so forth. So, um, this is something that we can have an impact on it. It's something fairly easy to. I put the table up there, and there are different charts and tables depending on work sites and who the regulatory bodies are and that sort of thing. As far as when hearing damage occurs and what we should be protecting from and how we should be protecting from that. So when we take a look at um, hearing protection, we look at the, the hazard or how loud the noise is and what the length of exposure is and then how long we're working in that environment and then the type of hearing protection. So the decibels of protection there or the DB rating that we take a look at. So those all things will come into play when we're looking at the wearable technology on the next few slides. So when it comes to protecting ourselves from noise related injuries, there are many different tools out there that we can use. I need to click back on the slide. First off, we need to know what type of hazard are we being exposed to and how long. So um, industrial hygienists and others use tools called sound level meters 
so that we know how loud the environment is, a, a measurement of the loudness of the environment we're working in. There are several apps we can download for our phones, and these have been proven to be fairly effective um, at measuring those over either points of time. Um, one that I like to recommend is called Decibel X, or it used to be called Decibel 10. Um, but what it does is it can log that over time. So if you want to record some noise exposure over a period of time, you can have this running while you're doing it different tasks or purposefully putting it in a location to monitor that. Um, we can set different alerts and that sort of thing to alert us when sound levels Something that I discovered, I know Mary just mentioned she discovered something with her Fitbit. Uh, I can remember the first time I was at a sporting event in a gymnasium and my watch told me that the noise level in when my surroundings was too loud. So this is an example from the Apple Watch. There's actually a noise monitoring uh, app that's built in there that tells you, and you can see some examples at the bottom there of when the noise levels are okay, whether it's too loud, it gives you a little bit of information and you can actually set a threshold of when you're notified when the noise levels are too loud. Um, so this is just one example of, of monitoring that sound, but starting to get to the point of how can we protect ourselves from that. But monitoring is sort of the first step when we get to that. Um, when it comes to the actual hearing protection, there's some different types of devices out there that I like to recommend and we've been testing out with different groups. Um, this one comes from Ryobi. It's a tool that uh, the little green power tools you find at Home Depot um, built by Ryobi. They have a whole suite of tools that works with smartphones. And I found this one to be useful on the safety and health side is it's actual certified hearing protection Remember on that first table, we talked about decibel reductions. These actually have a great noise reduction rating, um, as well as one of the big arguments we get when we wear hearing protection is we can't hear what's going on around us or our situational awareness. This actually allows some sounds to go through. Um, what it does is it has a microphone on the outside and speakers on the inside. So you can listen to other things, take phone calls, whatever it may be, but it does provide hearing protection. And as we'll get to later and taking a look at why people wear stuff and how we can get them to continue to wear stuff, the more things something do, the better off it is. So that this allows us to do more things than just protect our hearing, encourages people to wear them. Um, so it's a certified, has a noise reduction rating, it's been tested, and then it also filters sounds. Um, I see quick question, where do you buy this? So Ryo. Uh, Home Depot's website or Ryobi's website will point you into places. Um, Ry Ryobi uh, exclusively sells their stuff through Home Depot. Um, and that's normally where I order them is through Home Depot's website. They cost about $20, which is a pretty cheap tool to use. And it's one, you know, for just looking to get into this, um, it's one that's pretty non-invasive to get workers to use or for us to use. They're great for mowing your lawn or doing other tasks that you do on a regular basis if you're not always around loud stuff. There are other manufacturers. This is one from 3M. Here you can see they're called EAR buds, so Peltor earbuds, and they come with different tips, um, volume control, other thing like that. So there's other brands of these out there as well. Uh, one thing about the Ryobi one is it comes with an app where you can filter out like high, low, or medium frequency sounds. So if there's an annoying sound or a, an overwhelming sound, you can filter that out and still hear the other sound levels around you. Uh, the 3M ones just work like regular earphones, but they isolate the sound and only allow the sounds that you want to go through. Another for hearing and listening to things that I kind of like are called bone conduction headphones. So bone conduction headphones don't actually go in your ear. They rest in front of your ear and the sound actually goes through your bone. That's how we hear ourselves talk a lot of times. That's why we sound differently uh, when we hear ourselves talk versus when we hear a recording of us talking because of that bone conduction. But what these allow you to do is either to keep your ear completely open so that you have that situational awareness or allows you to wear standard earplugs or earmuffs um, if you can get to them to seal over top of them. So this is another type of hearing 
protection. They market these in the fitness field as, you know, joggers and other things. You can still hear the automobile traffic and other things going on around you while you're still taking phone calls or listening uh, to your music. So this is just one other type of uh, area you can you can take a look at when you're looking at how can I protect my hearing and still have some other functions. So that's hearing protection. The next one that's fairly easy to take a look at and to get measurements on is heat illness. So we've probably heard of cases of people becoming overheated in work, especially in outdoor agricultural work in the summertime. Uh, there's different guidelines out there as far as what heat level we need to do other things, or you can see in the bottom right corner there that the protective measures we need to take at different heat levels. And the heat index is basically the top chart where we take a look at what's the humidity outside and what's the temperature outside. And then that gives us our different zones that we need to protect ourselves from. And then the heat index guidelines below help out with that as well. So there's some pretty simple ways to measure that heat index. And if we go back to those questions we asked at the beginning, you know, this would be that environmental monitoring. Uh, the noise protection would be the environmental monitoring too. We're not really measuring anything about us yet. We're just measuring this. So that comes into play a lot. I know we've received some early questions ahead of time looking at privacy of our workers and of our own data, where when we're mon monitoring noise levels, we're monitoring heat, this really doesn't get too much into data privacy. So sometimes these are easier places to get start started than when we're measuring biometrics of a person. So the traditional tool that we measured heat index with and heat exposure with was one of these handheld devices. And Kestrel's a brand that's been around for a while. It's pretty well known. They're they're laboratory certified, and these are typically what if we have OSHA inspectors doing heat illness uh, measurements, that's what they'll end up using. Um, this company has also built some wearable devices, or these dongles, as, as they call them. The Kestrel Drop is one of those, and they range in price from $70 to $100, maybe a little bit more based on what measurements they take. They are ruggedized, so they're going to help. Um, they're waterproof. They show some examples of where they buried these in the ground for a while, dug them back up, they still work okay. And I've been using these in a couple different studies and they've worked very well and been durable. They do chew up batteries a little bit because they're always on. Um, so being prepared for that is a, probably a different discussion of managing the wearable devices. Um, these can be found on Kestrel's website as well as Amazon carries them depending on where you like to buy things. Um, I haven't found them in actual big box stores or any stores like that yet. Um, but one thing nice about these, they do come along with an app that supports them. They communicate through Bluetooth. So any Bluetooth device we have, which uh, those newer smartphones all have in them, uh, you can put multiple devices onto one phone. This is probably something you don't have to have on each one of your employees, but it's important to have them in the location of the employees. We'll get a look, take a look a little bit later at OSHA has a heat illness tool for a phone and um, it pulls the weather from the closest weather station, which may not be very close to your actual location. Typically they're at airports, which might have totally different weather than where you're actually working. So managers or others, um, not every worker would have to have these, but someone in the vicinity of your group of workers uh, could help monitor that. You can set the app up to give you different um, warnings, uh, tell you when to take a break. If we remember on that chart, um, at different heat levels, you should be taking breaks, drinking certain amounts of water. So you can use this app to help you uh, remember to do all of that, as well as keep a log of what the working conditions were for that period of time. Um, so they're a very useful tool for monitoring heat. So that's taking a look at the heat index and preventing heat illness. Then we can go to the other end of heat illness and look at detecting heat illness. So if uh, we want to monitor the actual person, so this gets more into the biometrics. Um, I started a study a long time ago when Microsoft still made their um, wearable devices, looking at how can we detect fevers in people. Um, so that same technology that we use to detect fevers, skin temperature, skin resistance, those type of things, uh, heart rate, 
bringing those all together, we can also detect heat illness in people or the early onset of heat illness so that we can get them treatment uh, before the heat illness becomes too severe. So different types of wearable devices allow us to, to do that as well. Um, there's not one specific one out there right now that I would recommend for that. You sort of need to see your situation, what your budget is. Um, we use the Microsoft Band in our study, which they no longer make. Um, so we'll have to take a look at if you're interested in that type of study or that type of monitoring. Uh, I would say it's better to monitor the environment and prevent the heat illness than trying to detect it with early onset of heat illness. Other types of things that we measure or other types of injuries, um, I classify these as ergonomic injuries. So how do we prevent repetitive movement injuries? How do we prevent stress, over stress injuries, overwork type injuries? So how do we help better fit our tasks, tools and work environment to the people that are doing the job? And one way that we can do this is through heart rate monitors. And I'll give you some examples here, but here are some, some heart rate monitors that I like to use. Uh, Polar, which is the, the one on the right, has been well known in the fitness industry, the, the Polar brand for heart rate monitors, everything from chest straps, which it's really hard to get workers to wear chest straps unless you incentivize it. Uh, but there are other types of heart rate monitors. We know our watches, our Fitbits. This is just a band that goes around your arm. Um, it also has a clip so that it'll fit onto a hat or a hat band. And you can even stick them on your waistband to monitor your heart rate. So there's other places to locate those. And part of selecting the technology you'd like to use is the compliance or how much people are going to actually use the devices as well. Um, another heart rate monitor that I really like, we talked about hearing protection and stuff early on. This is another set of headphones that don't offer official hearing protection, but they do have a heart rate monitor built into them. You can see the headphone on the left there has the little heart symbol, and it has an optical heart rate uh, sensor that works from right inside your ear. So another place to, to collect your heart rate from and another type of device, again, that adds some other functionality to it other than just collecting your heart rate. One project that I did where we were looking at optimizing hand tools. So with the Green Heron Tool Company out of Pennsylvania, uh, when I was at Penn State, I worked with them. And then since I've been here in Nebraska, um, developing a hand tool. There you can see their wonderful shovel on the right side with the big green handle. But early on in our testing on the picture on the left, you can see all the different apparatus we had hooked up to a person. We were monitoring their oxygen consumption, their movement, the little yellow dots on their legs and up over their body to look at some bio, biomechanics, um, as well as heart rate monitors and other things like that. But after those studies, we came to figure out that mo just monitoring heart rate was enough to give us a good um, feedback on how a tool was for a person to use. So obviously the higher the heart rate with the same task and a different tool uh, meant that the tool didn't fit as well. So keeping our heart rates low while we're using different types of tools or doing different tasks helps us fit the task or the environment to the person better um, than um, just using whatever tools available. So that was one of our big purposes of that study was to figure out how do we monitor that and how do we des design the ideal tool uh, for people out there working. And this is just an example, this uh, heart rate band that I have listed here is one that you can grab on Amazon for about $20 versus some of the more expensive heart, heart rate uh, monitors or some of the other ones. Um, I should have mentioned on this page uh, the polar ones around $80, uh, the headphones I think are around $100. So if you're looking for a lower cost heart rate monitor, um, that's where some of these other bands uh, come into play. If you're just looking at single functionality, some of them also will give you alerts like vibrations and other things like that when you set limits that uh, you don't want to exceed. So that's one example of that. Um, another example of something we can monitor um, when it comes to workers, and I think we had a question early on about this, about fatigue. So how do we measure fatigue? We know this is a study I found from the National Safety Council, just looking at overall workers that we know that, and I don't know, only 77% reported being ex fatigued at work. I, I would think that would be a little bit higher, but um, 
And then about 40% of them actually admitted to saying they believe that fatigue uh, played a role in being injured at the workplace uh, or caused a serious injury in the workplace. So we know how fatigue can impact that. There's lots of studies out there. So by mo monitoring our fatigue, and one way of doing that is monitoring our sleep. And a lot of the fitness trackers these days do this. And I should have mentioned early on, I just said fitness tracker. Um, the fitness industry has more money and more ambition to spread uh, around when it comes to these type of monitors. So there's lots of things we can learn from them. The sporting industries, now we know that uh, sports teams are monitoring their players at practices and even during events. They can tell how hard they're working, if they're not working hard enough, if they're overworking. I'm not sure we want to apply those concepts to agriculture maybe yet, um, or not all our workers want us to apply that to them yet. But we can still learn from what they're doing and how can we apply those concepts to keeping our workers safer and healthier. And this study sort of leads into that a little bit as far as trying to monitor um, sleep is one of the ways that we can monitor fatigue. Other things we can do and other studies out there have looked at gait. So how people walk based on how tired they are, um, how stable we are as far as when we stand still, do we sway very much? And there's other studies that have looked at that. But for us to do it on our own, sleep is one of the biggest ways that we can monitor fatigue um, and making sure that everyone's well rested to reduce that. Uh, but there are other measures, like I mentioned, that galvanic skin resistance that we use to protect heat illness can be used to measure fatigue, um, as well as um, heart rates, resting heart rates, and those type of things can all change when we take a look at measuring fatigue in people. Another environmental factor that we can measure and that people have asked about is um, air quality. <clears throat> so uh, particulates in the air are something that are um, fairly easy to measure and there are several tools out there. This is a, a story from back in 2014 and a lot of times these measurements and devices come from um, some countries that have worse pollution than the US. Um, so a lot of foreign countries have developed these. There are different ones coming and going, and that's something I should have mentioned early on too, and, we, and when I will when we talk about selecting them, is some of these, and I already hinted to that with the Microsoft Band going away, some of these devices come and go. So when we're developing policies and systems to use these devices, it's good to make them flexible because we not, may not always have the same device that we built our system around or built our protocols around available in four or five years. Um, so it's a pretty fluctuating market as far as what devices are available out there. Uh, but there are devices that measure air quality. Uh, a lot of times they just based it on not necessarily the type, but the quantity of particulates in the air. Uh, but that can give us a good indication um, based on our location and other places, this is actually a, a newer device uh, that came out from Plume Labs that takes a look at air quality. A lot of these, I think it's funny, they say they're affordable sensors, but they're still around $100 for the air quality sensors. But again, it's something that not everybody has to wear. If one person in the work site has it or there's one on location, um, they can do this. Um, a lot of times they put the data into crowdsourcing sites so that you can create a map of where the different data is at um, or what the air quality is. Uh, I've seen the same thing with noise and noise measurements. There's some crowdsourcing um, sites that do that as far as noise data. So when you go to buy a house, you know what are the quiet and the loud parts of the um, neighborhoods. So, but we can use that same technology at the work site to see where are the loud spots, where do we need to wear hearing protection, where is it recommended, where is it less likely that we need to have it uh, working out in the field without machinery versus working around machinery or on the farmstead. So there's lots of different areas that we can create these maps uh, potentially down the road. Um, so we can monitor at the individual level or we can monitor at the farm level. So air quality is another one that there are different uh, measurements out there. Um, and different types of measurements that we can take looking at air quality. And then sort of pulling it all together, I talked a little bit about the management and the systems and how do we you know, utilize all this data. This was actually a project and a technology that was started because of a gentleman 
um, in northern Indiana that had asthma and he wanted co to continue grain farming. So he created a system of cameras and automated augers and motors that he could turn on and off his grain augers and monitor those with cameras and uh, his smartphone from within his side, inside his truck. Uh, but we talked several years back and talked about adding um, heart rate data to this. So if someone was working around this automated system, their heart rate went up, um, and then would it shut, could we shut off the systems knowing that there might be a potential problem going on? Especially if we asked a question and said, hey, is everything okay? They don't respond, then we shut down the grain handling system um, as some added protection. So there's still a lot of work to be done when it comes to the automated systems and how we integrate all these different sensors. So we know there are sensors out there that we can utilize. I actually have a project now where we're looking at firefighters and first responders and monitoring similar things with them. But how do we pull this all into a dashboard for somebody to take a look at and monitor these workers and make sure they're safe at the same time? Um, so that gets into issues with data privacy and other things like that along the way. So um, that's probably something that will be need to be built into risk management plans and other types of management plans when it gets to the point of using sensors and collecting data is how do we protect people's privacy and what are the, the limitations of doing that? So that's a, a brief overview of some of the wearables that are out there. There are a lot more out there and I, I welcome the opportunity to help you find the right one for your applications. Uh, but now I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit into um, into the uh, looking at how we select those. And I just glazed out, glanced down real quick and saw something about uh, measurements of cell uh, towers and radiation. And those yeah, I was just gonna interrupt and say, if anybody has any questions to date, this would be a great time to yeah. pop them in. And we've got so one on I know there are towers. different meters out there for measuring that. Um, I don't know about personal wearable devices that the radiation, all the, the meters I know for measuring radiation are lab-based ones looking more at nuclear medicine and those type of things. And uh, the radiation levels coming off of cell phone towers aren't enough to, to be registered on those type of meters. Um, I know I have heard some concerns with, especially the new 5G towers and the type of radiation they put off. Uh, but I don't know of any personal wearable devices. I know there are more expensive meters you can measure those type of things with. Um, I would say that if there are concerns about towers being close by, that you can have those type of tests done um, by either the, the cell phone providers that can come out and take those measurements, um, as well as other independent firms do that. Um, question about the bone conduction headphones. Does it sound different than over the year? The sound quality isn't always quite as good. I wouldn't say, you know, you're not, if you're an audiophile, you'll probably tell the difference. I have a pair that I use on a regular basis. I can't tell the difference. Um, I know they adjust the, the sound a little bit, the way that it comes out and through those. Um, so I would say for the, for the average person, the audio isn't any different. What I have noticed is people around me are more likely to hear what it's playing because it almost emits sound in all directions versus when you have earbuds in your phone, in your ear, it just goes into your ear. So I did notice that um, when it came to the bone conductions. But other than that, I think they do a, a, a good job of medium quality sound levels. Uh, again, like I said, if you're a true audiophile and you have Bose headphones, uh, they're not going to quite compete with those, but any mid to, to <laughs> low end hearing, they're going to do that. Um, one question about agricultural risk would uh, air quality monitors measure. Um, they're not just for urban air pollution. So any, any particulates in the air, that's when we start thinking about when do we need respiratory protection. Respiratory so would protection. this be like what uh, smoke from wildfires? And... So it could be smoke from wild. It could be dust from dust killing in the soil. Air. It could be grain dust, those type of dust. So we, we can't specifically say what hazards are in the dust, but we know if we're breathing dust, there's the likelihood of something bad. So most of us know whether we're working in like an animal confinement facility or a grain handling facility out in the dust from soils and those type of things. 
any of those partic particles are going to start giving us some some respiratory problems as far as the do diagnosis they, and diseases. Do they, they pick up um, pollen counts as well, Aaron, or no? no? Pollen would be a particulate that would be in the air. So if you okay. if you know there's no other dust in the air and the part and the air quality meter starts going off, you know that it's most likely pollen. You have to add a little bit of your knowledge of your surroundings to tell what is in the air. So it's not measuring what's in the air. It's just telling you that there's something in the air that you probably want to be concerned about. Um, obviously certain dusts are less uh, of, a, of a hazard to us than other types of dust. It's not going to measure gases. So we'd need different types of meters if we wanted to measure gases like manure gases and that sort of thing. Most of these are just particulates. Um, even diesel exhaust fumes have enough particulates in them uh, to get a, a meter like this to register. So that's a good question. So I'm gonna to shift to uh, selecting wearable uh, devices and picking apps and that sort. Um, there's a great group out there called Endeavor Partners that takes a look at behavior change based on wearables. So that's part of the reason we wanna wear these, right? Is to get our behaviors to change to make us healthier and safer. Um, they, they, one of the studies they did took a look at how long people continue to use wearable devices. And I always say, I, I think this is a little inaccurate because I know people that have received wearable devices that are still on their dresser and they've never used them at all. Um, so even hundred percent utilization at the, at the beginning, um, after a year, we're down to about half and out two years, we're under half of people that are still using these devices. So that's why it's important uh, to, to take a look at that and to take a look at the different um, devices and what they do and how we can get people to continue to wear them. So the compliance of wearing them. Um, with that being said, there are different things we can do to make sure when we select devices, people are gonna continue to wear them. Um, I like this table again from that same group that takes a look at some of the different functions of wearable devices and how we can get people, uh, what they're good at, what they're not good at. I like the orange categories here. They're the ones habit formation, what's gonna get people to change habits. Is there social motivation? Can we have competitions with other workers or are there ways we can brag about what we're doing good? And then that goal reinforcement. Although there's other things over there, the Spartan helmet there gives us the durability. And I know that's a concern, especially in outdoor environments, how durable is something. So we can take a look through this list and some of these things we've heard of before, probably not many of you realize that, um, that uh, Skechers ever created a, a fitness tracker. That's because if you take a look at it, it wasn't really good at anything versus some of the companies like Fitbit, which is sort of the, the Kleenex of fitness trackers um, when it comes to brand recognition, uh, does a lot of things well. So that is one good thing about that. Um, so that would be some of the different things that we would wanna look at and different categories we wanna look at when we take a look at um, whether we can do that. Something that I'm interested in from the research side is the one that says API there. So that's a, the, what type of coding does it use to transmit data? And can I actually tap into that to use it for other systems or use it in my own data management systems? So some do that better than others. I know Polar's one that we've been working with as well as a, a few other ones, the, the Kestrel tracker. Uh, a lot of companies now are sharing their communication protocols so we can integrate these into other safety systems that we're using. So as all good researchers, me and a few of my friends that I think at least a couple of them might be on here or from their institution at the Marshfield Clinic, um, took a look at how, do we, how can we give people a tool to evaluate different technologies that they might be using for health and safety. So we did this research project, did, uh, wrote a paper about it. Uh, there's some more links to it later on. And I think we'll share this um, as well, this presentation uh, to anyone that would like to see it. Um, so anyhow, we came up with this system that took a look at different things like relevance, function, value, and privacy. I know privacy is a question that comes up from time to time, uh, but does it do what we want it to do? Um, does it help with safety and health? 
Does it perform how it's supposed to? Is it usable? We've all had those apps that we've used that we couldn't figure out how to get somewhere or how to enter data or how to find the data that we're looking for. And then things like value, advertisement, privacy, those things. So we came up with this rating system and this is available online for anybody that would like to use it uh, to evaluate different types of technology when you're doing the comparisons. How well does it rank in each one of these things? We made up an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, we made it on a four point scale so that people couldn't uh, chicken out and just pick the middle category. But then we had to convert it to a five point scale thanks to Amazon. We know everything has one through five stars, right? Uh, so we made it, made it in a way that you could do some of these tests. You could rank some of the different technology that you're looking at. Um, and this tool is freely available to anybody that would like to use it and we welcome feedback on it as well. We had a group of experts, you can see the experts keep getting younger and younger, but we had people from different occupations, different type of devices use this um, to actually help um, streamline the tool and give us feedback on the tool. Overall, it was accepted very well, it worked well uh, for those that uh, needed something like this, so it got good, good reviews. Uh, we did, have two apps that we had people, and these are two more apps that I would recommend uh, to people. I mentioned the, the heat illness and heat prevention. Um, this is the OSHA heat safety tool. Um, it's a, an app you can download, it's available out there. And actually through our review process, a few of our experts picked out a few issues that were wrong with this app. We sent it to OSHA and they updated it. So we saw that as a win as well. And then ladder safety tool. If you use a ladder, it basically uses your ladder or your smartphone as an angle gauge. You tell it what type of ladder you're setting up. Uh, you stick that on it and it tells you, you can see the red bar and the green dot, whether your ladder's at the right angle. So we had people test out these apps to test out our rubric. Um, sort of giving everybody, and then we let them pick one of their own apps to test it out with. Um, so those are some more apps that are useful for, for testing. One of the biggest surprises we got were around that security issue and data privacy issue. Um, it seemed like most people either didn't know enough to know anything or didn't care what data was being collected. I know some people are a lot more protective of their data than that. And some of that was dependent on device type. I know on Android devices, when you install apps, it asks you what data it's gonna take and then whether it could share it and that. Uh, on iOS devices and Apple devices, it, it kind of builds that into the first time that you do something and then it doesn't keep asking you those questions for each app. So, um, but these were some interesting quotes. You know, I have no idea how much information it's collecting. I'm not concerned with it collecting my information. And um, there should be a, <laughs> a non-applicable because I couldn't even find this info out. So that's kind of uh, concerning when it comes to data privacy and um, that. So again, something we need to, to consider for collecting other people's data um, or requiring them to use these type of apps in the workplace. Aaron, when did, I'm just curious, when did you actually conduct this particular, collect this data? Uh, I'm gonna look back at the publication date. Um, does it say when it was published there? 2016, so it would have been around 2014, 2015. Okay, so I wonder if that that would change now, just because we've had so many big data breaches. But it may in the, in the past few years, you know. But yeah. I think a lot of people. I mean, this data isn't really data that is sometimes personally identifiable mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because it, it doesn't tie in. It's nothing that people could, you know, create a new bank account with. Right, right. You know, so it's not that type of personal information, but it is still our health information, um, which could be concerning. In, in most situations, but good, good point. So anyhow, there's the website you can go to if you look at Marshfield Clinic, mobile app evaluation, Google that, that would show up. We did see that it was valuable. Um, we do think it's a good to try to standardize some of the evaluation in this area and that this tool could be or will be useful uh, for safety specialists, managers, and even workers when it comes to selecting different types of technology to use related to health and safety. So that's a, a little bit of a tool and some of the thoughts we need to consider when we start collecting a technology. I did also want to list, we have a e-extension site 
that lists some egg safety and health mobile apps. Um, there are a few games out there uh, that we've created throughout the years. And this gives me a, a moment to, to plug another project that I didn't put in here, but I see Sue was one of the participants. Uh, we created a virtual reality or she and her group created, I just assisted a little bit, created a virtual reality tractor driving for training uh, different types of um, hazards that are out there. It was designed for nursing students, but we're looking to expand that and maybe use it. We've had some exciting conversations even post-development. We just had a, a public power district reach out to us and say, hey, can we can we include over line, overhead power line safety or power uh, generation safety in this as well? And um, so it's exciting to see where that may go. So there might be some virtual reality and other stuff we can include in here. Um, I can re I remember several years ago at a, uh, a USDA conference, their Outlook conference that talks about technology. Um, they were using virtual reality to train meat inspectors because they had a high turnover. People would sign up to become a meat inspector. Their first day on the job, they would quit because they didn't realize what it was like inside of a meat packing plant. So they use virtual reality to onboard people before they actually hire them. So they obviously don't have the smells of the meatpacking plant, but they have the, uh, the visuals of the meatpacking plant to make sure that's the job they want to do. But anyhow, I think there's lots of opportunities for um, virtual reality and augmented reality and that sort of thing that we'll see coming down the line when it comes to technology. But that's an aside. This website has some other tools out there. Again, just like with the wearable devices, um, borrowing from other industries or borrowing from other places, the construction industry, other industries that are similar to agriculture when it comes to their hazards and their uh, mitigation of hazards, uh, we can learn from them as well. So there's some of those uh, in there and sprinkled in as well. So other management type tools when it comes to that. Uh, picking the right tools, machine sizing, that type of thing, that all plays a role in keeping us safe and healthy out there um, as we're doing this. Another program, and I think we have some people from this as well on here, um, that is technology that can be integrated into other aspects of, of agriculture. This one was a creating maps of your farms and listing where the hazards are. And it was aimed at first responders, but this is also a great way to train employees to let them know where the different hazards are uh, to help them participate in this. And again, you know, the tie between the technology and back to our first responders um, is, is always useful. I mentioned another project I have monitoring first responders. Um, and then there is an overlap between the first responders, you know, the rural, rural areas having volunteer firefighters that include a lot of agricultural employees in that group. So there's some overlap between the group. So a lot of times our first responders are good safety and health managers on agricultural sites or a great place to look for resources when it comes to that. Uh, preventing heat illness, all those type of things are things that they've been trained in as well at their other job, if you want to call it that. So I'm gonna, that's all I wanted. I've talked for 45 minutes now, we're almost 50 minutes. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to, to share or uh, success stories with technology or anything they'd like to advertise that they've been working on? I know we have a mixed group of, of researchers, practitioners, and people that are actually out there working in agriculture. So um, I welcome any of that. Feel free to open your mics and talk or um, put it in the chat. I know some of you aren't that bashful. I'm gonna put up the credit slide while we uh, talk about that. So do we have any other input questions, comments? I don't see anything right now, but I will just take a minute and say thank you, Aaron, for being here today. And um, this, if you have, um, as I said, this is a multiple year project that we've been working on related to farm labor. And uh, we're just starting now to um, take a look at uh, safety, ergonomics, health, things like that. So if you have suggestions for us, um, if you have topics that you'd like us to explore or that you'd like us to know about, please feel free to share those at any time. 
Um, this will be up on our uh, farm labor dashboard, the recording as well. And we are in the process of developing sort of a farm labor learning network, which is really open to anybody who is interested in these types of topics and, and really just wants to share ideas and uh, maybe collaborate on future funding proposals. So if you're interested in that, just please drop your email in the, the chat or let us know somehow. Yeah, and like I said, feel free to reach out at any time with comments or questions. I'm always looking for uh, new directions to go, more stuff to do. And if you have money to throw at it, that's even better. Okay, not seeing any any. Uh, questions in the chat box. So I think we can um, let people get back to their lives unless somebody's got some some final comments or anything. One oh, more question youth, there. youth training. Yeah, so I know someone up the up the uh, the list there also already talked about um, Dee Jepson at Ohio State. She's one of my colleagues that I work with quite often. And she has, you know, we've worked for many years on youth tractor driving safety. Um, and uh, she has working with a group to develop a VR experience for tractor driving safety, um, as well as the one that we have, we're looking to use with our, our youth. Um, there's a national program to teach 14 and 15 year olds uh, tractor safety and um, there's lots of great resources through Penn State, the National Safe Tractor and Machinery Operation Program, and so forth. And we integrate a lot of these. We take this, those hearing protection that we looked at, those Ryobi earplugs. Uh, we've been giving them out at some of those events. Uh, we talk about those and talk about hearing protection and some of this technology to that group as well, which has been very accepting of it. And they really don't care about data privacy at all. If you've ever seen their Instagram posts and Snapchats and all that kind of stuff, I try to stay up on all that to keep track of my kids. But um, data privacy is something that they don't think about too much. But yes, so that's a great question. We try to integrate the youth in this as well and using FFA groups and 4-H groups um, the ear, the hearing protection is something that is fairly low cost and we can get a lot of them to buy in. We know with the hearing protection, the earlier we can start with that, the better. Um, so that's something that we do at trade shows and other places. So um, there's lots of opportunities to do this with youth. And we try to get out there and speak to them about the technology as well. And that's really where some of those farm mapping programs started from FFA and other things like that used to do it as paper maps that they would put on mailbox posts. So um, we try to keep the youth integrated as much as possible. Um, question about farmers adapting the, the VR type stuff. Um, we've been using it in other realms than just with farmers, more on the educational realm. Um, we did have a pilot when we did the farm map with uh, where you sort of like, I called it Pokemon Go map. Um, so it was augmented reality where you could, once you had the map created, you could hold up the iPad or whatever and move it around and it would tell you in what direction and how far the different hazards were or the different pins you put on the map. And that was something that the rural firefighters and the farmers did like when it came to that. So maybe more augmented reality stuff rather than virtual reality stuff, but looking at uh, some of those applications. But that's a good question too, and something that definitely could be looked into further. Great questions. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the, the adoption question is the big nut that has to be cracked for all of this stuff is, can you get the farmers to invest in it? Can you get the employees to use it? Can you, you know, can you in, get the decision makers to make good decisions based on the feedback that it's giving you? So. Yeah, and some of the same questions that come up that we've always had with personal protective equipment, you know, it doesn't fit well, we don't like to wear it, it prevents us from doing something as efficiently as we did something else with. It reminds me of when I bought my dad a pair of earmuffs that also had a radio in them, hoping that he would wear them when he mowed the grass, get him to wear hearing protection because they had a radio in them and he liked to listen to the radio. So that's where it comes to selecting the right equipment that fits well and possibly does some other things that gets people to want to do it. 
but ask Mary about it being recorded and posted? Yes, we will have this. Uh, it has been recorded and we will clean it up a little bit and post it on the, oh, Beth just posted the, the dashboard link. So you're welcome to go there. There's all kinds of uh, labor related kind of information there. Um, and this will be a part of it as soon as we can get it up there. So thank you all for taking time out of your day to join us. And again, if you have any interest in this topic and you want to explore it further, we'd love to hear from you and um, hear your ideas and your thoughts and things that are working, things that are not working, all things labor related we're interested in. Yes, so thank you all. Uh, pest, one last question, pesticide question safety. About pesticides. I'm not aware of any wearable when it comes to, the biggest thing with pesticide application that we can monitor is the heat illness. We know when people, we've been doing some testing with Tyvek suits and other things like that. Heat illness is probably a bigger issue if people are wearing the right PPE with pesticide application. Um, actual exposure to chemicals, there aren't any low cost monitors that I'm aware of for that. There are other ways to measure that. Uh, pesticide exposure, but not nearly as good as some of these other monitors that we currently have. Good question. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us, yes. and we will um, see you all next time. Thanks, Aaron. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone.